Well, well thanks for inviting me to uh, to speak to this group. It's uh, it's an honor, and uh, on on a very important topic. And uh, just at the outset, I, you know, I work for the UPMC Center for Health Security, which is a, a public health think tank that some of you may be familiar with. We work on pandemic preparedness, bioterrorism, emerging infectious diseases. And one of the things that we look at are uh, uses of biological weapons historically. And the idea for this talk came about by kind of looking historically back at uh, entomological warfare, because a lot of people are talking about the potential for gene drives to be used in this field. And I think the best way to think about it is to actually think about what's been done in the past and how would gene drives make that easier or harder, or, or what would what would happen when you put gene drives into that context. So you know, the object objectives of this talk are really to uh, give you a historical overview of the, the times that they've used entomological vectors to spread disease, and then kind of think about some of the, the human health and agricultural impacts that could happen if, if such a, uh, uh, a use was undertaken, and then think about how gene drives might increase the effectiveness of this technique. And I think Dr. Fletcher's talk gave you a lot of uh, concretization of some of the speculation I'm going to engage in, and, and I think hopefully some of the historical context will uh, synergize with some of the concepts that she introduced. So when you think about <clears throat> entomological warfare, there's really three forms that uh, people have recognized. Direct attacks uh, against a, a person, agroterrorism, which Dr. Fletcher went into great detail about, and as well, and then the spread of vectors of disease. And I'll talk a little bit about that and some candidate diseases that people have thought about. But that's basically uh, the three main forms you would think about it. So when you think about historical considerations, most of the times this has been direct attack. So there's a, a great book I put there on the right on the right there that I recommend to everybody called Greek Fire, Poison Arrows, and Scorpion Bombs. And that talks about biological and chemical warfare that happened in the ancient world. And there they literally mean scorpion bombs, bo explosions uh, explosions that, that actually like would disperse scorpions onto the deck of a ship, for example. Or <clears throat> for example, a bee bomb, just taking a, a beehive and turning it into a weapon. That was something that was well well known in the ancient world and done. Um, they also used uh, insects as, uh, as elements of torture because of people's fear of certain insects and stinging insects in particular. So that's kind of historically what happened. And maybe, maybe people think that that's just ancient, but during the Vietnam War, uh, the Viet Cong would use would put rig explosives to beehives, and, and U.S. soldiers would walk by a beehive, and it would explode and disperse the bees onto people. So this carried on from the ancient world all the way into the 20th century. And some of this has been covered under the Geneva Convention, although most people don't. It's very hard to find good wording that actually talks about the use of entomological warfare in the Geneva Convention, but it is something that was uh, discussed during, that, uh, during the debates around that, uh, that treaty. And then the other thing to keep in mind is, is that people who have waged wars really have understood the problems with vector-borne diseases in war situations. And for example, um, Napoleon's invasion of, of Russia was, was largely derailed because of the spread of epidemic typhus in, in his troops because of the, the lice that were on them because they were unable to, to bathe or change their clothes. And that people really think that that changed the, the course of history because of, the, because of typhus. And there's a famous Lenin quote about, about the louse being able to, to derail him. And that book on the, uh, the other book that I've written there called The Illustrious Dead is, uh, that I've included there is um, a, a good explanation of Napoleon's troubles with typhus. And obviously malaria has always been a, a major issue in, in, uh, in war situations as well. And when you think about proto prototypical diseases, I think it's um, going to be diseases that are severe, that are going to require public health response, that are going to be chaos-inducing, things that kind of the same types of things we think about with biological weapons and biological terrorism, things that are really going to cause a splash. In agriculture, like Dr. Fletcher talked about, can, it's going to really be focused on economic impact there. And just think that's a picture there of killer bees swarming, and, and just imagine the chaos if, if, that, if something as simple as that were released in a major U.S. city. Even if it may not cause any problems, uh, the amount of social uh, panic and, and mayhem that would occur just from a killer bee uh, release or if killer bees were increased or, 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 or engineered would, would really uh, um, set people off. I think the most prototypical disease that people think about with this, and I think for, for good reasons, is, is dengue fever. And, and most of you probably know what dengue fever is. It's an acute viral febrile illness spread by the, the bite of the Aedes mosquito. And uh, it, was, it's, it, it still has a very considerable toll on the, on the world in countries like Brazil, for example, where dengue is a major uh, health risk. And right now in the United States, we're in the midst of a, an indigenous dengue outbreak in, in Hawaii, and we've had indigenous uh, 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 outbreaks in places like Key West and on the Texas-Mexico border. And the, the thing about dengue is not every case is bad, but there are cases where you can have uh, 
fatalities, uh, specifically on repeated infections where severe dengue can occur. And in, this, in these cases, when you aggregate them, really have a huge economic burden. Right now, we don't have a vaccine that's FDA available, and there's no specific treatment. So this is a major uh, thing to keep in mind. And if you look here, this is a map of where the vector species for Aedes is in the United States. That's basically the entire southern United States, uh, as well as Hawaii. And all you really need to have is a, a person who travels to a place where dengue is endemic, like Brazil or, or Puerto Rico, and comes back to the United States and then gets bit by this mosquito, and you can have a local outbreak. And that's likely what happened in Hawaii. That's likely what happened in Florida and Texas-Mexico border. People come across the border who are viremic. And, and that's really... Uh, a, a big danger because then once once a person is bit, you have a, a pool of viremic uh, individuals that can then spread the disease. The other disease that's historically thought about in terms of vector borne is, is plague, and, and in this condition, uh, Yersinia pe the Yersinia pestis bacteria uses fleas as vectors, and the mnemonic form is uh, communicable between people, which makes it uh, an attractive biological weapon. And we know uh, just from any cursory study of history that these impacts, the, the impact of plague has really changed the trajectory. I put a map there of, uh, of the United States because this is uh, an interesting, we, we really didn't have much plague in the United States until around the turn around uh, 1900. And, and this plague outbreak, which basically has seeded the entire western part of the United States uh, prairie dog population, really started because of plagues in, in, in Hong Kong where you had stowaway rats that basically um, came to San Francisco and then and it caused outbreaks in, in, in San Francisco and then spread throughout the, the western part of the, of the United States. And that, that's, a, a, I think, a very illustrative example of what can happen with a, with a vector-borne disease. Um, and obviously with plague, you can't really – this is one of the, proto, the classic examples of bioterrorism where, where bodies of people dead who were laden with fleas were catapulted over, over wall, uh, walls in the, in the siege of Kaffa in, right prior to the Black Death. And West Nile fever, most people have uh, had recent experience with it. This is a disease that really had never been seen in the United States until the 1990s and then found its way here. And it uses a Culex mosquito as a vector and basically has spread completely throughout the nation from never being in this nation. And during that time, there was speculation, for example, that the Iraqi Biological Weapons Program had introduced these mosquitoes into the United States. That was never proven uh, or, or really substantiated, but it was a, an active uh, uh, thought experiment that people were going through because the Soviets had experimented with uh, West Nile fever as an agent of bioterrorism, so it was somewhat uh, a possibility. Another disease that maybe not everybody uh, is completely familiar with is something called Rift Valley Fever. And this is a, an acute viral illness of humans and domesticated animals spread by various different mosquitoes. And it really causes major economic losses in livestock because it induces abortion. It's said to have a 100% abortion-inducing rate in, in, in uh, cattle, for example, and a very high case fatality rate as well. And there are outbreaks in... Uh, in uh, Africa and Mideast that have really had substantial economic tolls. And this disease can spill, in, spill into humans. Most people have mild or no symptoms, but 10% get severe disease. And of those that get severe disease, you know, 50% of them may die. Uh, so it's very, uh, a very concerning uh, disease, and it's one that people have really thought about in terms of entomological warfare. I'll get to that a little bit towards the end of my presentation. Um, another uh, interesting historical uh, spotlight is that during the American Civil War, the Confederacy accused the Union of introducing harlequin bugs to the South to cause crop damage. It's interesting because they themselves were trying to introduce uh, smallpox into the Union troops. And then you, I think a lot of this um, speculation and entomological warfare comes from thinking about the offensive bioweapons programs that occurred. And these are just a couple of highlights. So in the Soviet Union, uh, there was a biological weapons facility called the Zagorsk Institute where they raise mosquitoes capable of transmitting yellow fever, Venezuelan equine encephalitis, and Japanese encephalitis. So this was an active area of research for the Soviet Union. And interestingly, the Soviets, on the other hand, would then accuse the U.S. of using uh, biological weapons through, through mosquitoes. So, for example, during the 19, in 1972 to 1975, there was a, a WHO Indian Council of Medical Research malaria control unit where the Soviets accused the U.S. of, of using mosquitoes to transmit yellow fever. The same thing happened in 1982 in Pakistan where there was a USAID malaria facility in Lahore which was accused of being used by the CIA to breed mosquitoes to transmit disease in Afghanistan and Cuba. And that got to the level that the Pakistani government actually suspended the program because they began to believe the Soviets that that was what was going, going on there. 
And when you think about dengue, I mentioned dengue here, the, there was a large outbreak of dengue fever in Cuba, and the Soviets basically made it their official doctrine that that was caused by U.S. released mosquitoes. So most of the rank-and-file people in, in the Soviet military and in the Soviet biological weapons programs believed that the U.S. was using mosquitoes uh, in Cuba to spread dengue fever, although the higher-ups really knew it, was a, it wasn't true because Castro had um, requested Soviet assistance, and they had determined that it wasn't the U.S. It wasn't something that, the, that was coming from the United States. It was a naturally occurring strain. And interestingly, when I did a I did a study looking at how the the area of Key West responded to their dengue outbreak a couple of years ago, and I was interviewing some of the the insect. Uh, and vector control officials, and one happened to be a, an emigrate from Cuba, and he said when the, when Key West first had their cases, he thought that Castro himself, Castro released uh, mosquitoes there. So this is something that's in the population, in, in the mind of the population of people who work with mosquitoes in Cuba in, and maybe in South Florida, that, that dengue fever was something that people thought would really be used as a biological weapon. So when you think about gene drives, I think uh, uh, Dr. Fletcher really went into this, so I won't spend much time on it. In the vector control realm, they really have a great potential to diminish populations of disease-spreading vectors, to alter the ability of a vector to transmit disease. Maybe the mosquito can now not transmit this virus. And maybe you can even change the way that vectors bite. Maybe now uh, a vector won't sense humans and they won't bite humans, they'll only bite cattle, for example, and that would be uh, useful for diseases like dengue fever or malaria. And, and we already do have uh, GMO mosquitoes right now that are be, have been released in several countries, and there's contemplation that it may be released in key, they may be released in Key West as well. These are self-limiting and not a gene drive, despite what a lot of uh, the anti-GMO activists say. Say these are not uh, don't qualify, but I really think it illustrates how how genetic manipulation of vector species can be really useful for human health. And I think this slide from eLife is really really kind of shows you that there are a lot of benefits that uh, need to be considered when you uh, when you think about what what that this capacity could do to uh, improve human health. But there obviously is the dark side and the concern, and you know you really think about gene drives being able to spread a disease in the population, maybe by altering the susceptibility of a vector species for human for, for human diseases, maybe allowing different mosquitoes now to be able to transmit a certain disease, uh, maybe allowing the virus to go to higher levels in a in a, in a vector. You could also alter the insecticide sensitivity of a vector for both agricultural or human. Uh, human issue. So maybe now your, your pesticides don't work as well because you've engineered resistance in your vector and it's in your control, your malaria control, for example, may, may be derailed. Interestingly, you can even think about, think about this from, from a food or a, a fruit type of uh, uh, perspective where maybe you can suppress pollination in certain, in certain insect species so that would destroy, a person, destroy an area's crop. And I also think that there's an issue with the anti-GMO movement because basically the anti-GMO movement will seize on anything really to say, uh, to say, uh something bad may happen from some, from, from genetic manipulation of anything. And I really think they need to be, um, we need to really take consideration of what kind of rhetoric they're putting out there. Right now we're doing a study um, looking at some of the, the key, looking at the attitudes in the public population in Key West if they release these genetically modified mosquitoes. And there is basically a complete misinformation campaign going on by the anti-GMO movement there where they're denying that dengue ever occurred in Key West, where they're talking about, the, they're kind of rewriting biology saying that now, now uh, male mosquitoes, the, the GMO mosquitoes being released there will be male, that male mosquitoes are going to bite, which has, is not actually true. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation, and I think it's important that we uh, keep track of how they uh, deal with gene drives because they could really derail something that may have a good potential and really spread a lot of misinformation. So, you know, I think that in, if you think about gene drives and, and try to integrate that with what we know about entological morph warfare, they may be able to make warfare more efficient, more effective, more scalable, and more controllable. I mean, and, and so it is going to really be, uh, needs to be thought of as a dual-use uh, problem. But I do think that it's not all, it's not an easy hurdle for people to use. Um, I think the number needed to release of, a, of an organism may be very large to alter population, so it may not be able to be done so easily. And I know that some agricultural facilities, most of them in the U.S., test for the presence of trans genes, and they would be able to easily detect if there was a gene drive that was nefariously released, I think. Um, maybe that's not the case in, in outside the U.S. where trans genes aren't tested that often. We, you heard Dr. Fletcher talk about reversal drives or immunization drives that could be released to counter the effect. And there was just an article in Nature, I think, yesterday where they described them as calling them defensive drives. So I think that also could limit their, their, uh, their negative use. 
And I do think there's a lot of people do conflate state capacity with that of terrorist groups because terrorist groups may not be able to do this type of technology. There's probably a lot of tacit knowledge that's needed to use them in order to actually uh, make them effective. We saw Option Riccio fail multiple times to use biological weapons and then turn to chemical weapons. So that may be the same issue with gene drives. And, you know, there's a lot of, there's a motivational question. Is it worth the effort to go through this when they could just do na natural pathogens? Maybe they could just burn a crop field or use a, a standard pesticide or uh, or use a, a something like anthrax instead of having to go through this uh, as well. But I think that's, it, these are all things that need to be debated in, in the public sphere. And I know this, this article is making the rounds. Um, and I don't know how, how true it is, but I know, I think it illustrates the fact that people are thinking about how, how, uh, our genetic engineering capabilities may change the, change the world. And I just recommend this paper to people, if you can just search for it, called Entomological Terrorism, A Tactic in Asymmetrical Warfare, which really has all, lays out a lot of this. It came out several years ago, and it's from the military, and it has nice lists of different diseases and how they might uh, be impacted. And they also talk a little bit about Rift Valley fever in, in detail there and, what, and a kind of a scenario that might might occur. Well, that's all I have, so thanks for your, your attention. And, and just in general, some three uh, parting uh, summary comments. And entomological warfare is ancient. It's not something new. Modern biology has made it easier and more efficient. And I think the gene drives open up new possibilities for this type of approach. And there's a lot of good there with, uh, with the vet. So thank you, for, uh, thank you for your attention. And um, feel free to email me if I don't get to your questions, because I do have to run uh, shortly. But um, I hope you found that interesting.